Hello. In this paper, I read an episode of the popular British science fiction series Black Mirror as an environmental utopia. As a utopia, I argue it enunciates the biting critique of contemporary capitalism. But perhaps as striking about this episode, titled 15 Million Merits, is the manner in which it engages contemporary debates in environmental studies, particularly the meaning of the word wilderness in the discourse of the deep ecology movement. I argue that Merits literalizes a critique of wilderness as a concept akin to that formulated by William Cronon. If we hold on to a separation of the wild and the human inhabited environment, we end up locking ourselves away from any contact with the non-human wild whatsoever. In a reading of a plenitude of recent science fiction literature, Frederick Jameson has argued that utopia is an inherently, inherently critical form, expressing a, quote, desire for change. The point here is not, he says, quote, the representation of radical alternatives. It is rather simply the imperative to imagine them. End of quote. Utopia achieves this through, quote, cognitive dissonance, end of quote which is a term co coined by Darko Suvin. In science fictional worlds, there are things we recognize and things we don't. This dissonance leads us to think critically, a model proposed by Carl Friedman much earlier. And then James. 50 million merits practically functions as a model of a Jameson utopia. After the tile run, we find ourselves in a pitch black cubicle. Suddenly, the walls of the cubicle are illuminated as so many iPads, a virtual sun rises, and a virtual cock crows. Hitting the snooze button by a simple gesture, swiping uh, the cock away, the main character, Bingham Bing Mans Manson, begins to wake up. Brushing his teeth, we see him gesturing to pay merits, this world's currency, for his toothpaste. His morning ritual is interrupted, though, by a commercial for a sex show projected onto his bathroom walls. To stop viewing the commercial, Bing again pays a certain amount of merits. After this, we see Bing putting in earphones and riding the elevator to his place of employment, like so many others wearing exactly the same clothes as he does. Bing's job is simple. He treads an electric bicycle that, together with all his colleagues, powers the whole world. In the words of the episode, they are, quote, putting their back into giving back for a brighter now." End of quote. Gazes locked to a TV screen mounted before them, Bing and the others spend their time watching pornography, playing violent video games, watching TV shows, customizing their vir virtual avatars, or playing virtual violin, all, while, all the while earning merits while cycling. The video games and TV shows mainly involve the humiliation of the so-called lemons, obese people who cannot ride the bicycles and thus have of being condemned to clean up the hallways where other people work. There is one way out of this dreary existence. Via a TV show called Hot Shot, contestants can, can achieve celebrity stardom and can work in the entertainment business. When a new co-worker called Abby Khan arrives and Bing falls in love with her, he offers to pay the 15 million merits to let her participate in Hot Shot. I will pause my summary of the episode here to note the critique of capitalism. Everything is monetized and commercials are everywhere. In a remarkable critique of the music provider Spotify, the episode shows Bing refusing to watch a porn ad by closing his eyes, after which the ad stops, a high-pitched whistle resounds through his cubicle, and he is urged to resume watching or pay merits to cancel the advertisements. Similarly, Spotify offers a no commercial model for listening to music, um, and, but you pay for that model, or free music interrupted by advertisements that detect when you mute your device, as many users of the free version of Spotify uh, might have noticed. Very annoying. In 50 Million Merits, vending machines function much like Amazon does. When the main character purchases an apple for his lunch break, the machine, the vending machine, tells him he quote, might also like a banana. Finally, it's hard not to see the characters sweating on their bikes as, con as 
um, athletes in contemporary fitness centers, where bodily exercise is similarly converted into money. Perhaps the most biting criticism of the world of today is the hotshot show itself. Paying even 50 million merits, a lot of tender in the show, does not, or in this world, does not, it seem, make Abi or Bing unique. As they enter the waiting room for, to participate in the show, they encounter a large group of people intensely practicing. Some tell them that they have been waiting for a week. Abi, however, gets chosen for a preview immediately because of her looks. Forced to drink a liquid drug called compliance, she then finds herself in the spotlights in front of three abusive judges and an immense crowd of virtual avatars, some of which are Bing and Abby's cycling neighbors. Performing a song that has passed through her family for generations, but that is in fact a 20, 21st century pop song, Abby is interrupted by the judges, who claim they don't need singers anymore, and recruit her for the, one of the judges' popular porn channels. Drugged and under pressure from the audience, Abby reluctantly agrees to become a porn star, relinquishing her dreams um, of becoming a famous singer, but, but cheered on by the virtual audience who want to see her star in his porn show as well. The results of Abby's new employment are quickly projected onto the virtual walls of Bing's cubicle, something that almost drives him to suicide. Instead, he, revol he resolves to avenge himself by earning 15 million merits again and entering Hotshot himself. When he does enter, pre-selected as someone ethnic, signaling race politics in the same way as Abby's case did for gender, he does a brief act after which he threatens to kill himself with a glass shard unless his plaint is heard. In a moving performance of pure anger, he then protests against the fakeness of this world, portrayed in 50 million merits, saying, quote, fake fodder is the only thing that works anymore. Fake fodder and buying shit. That's how we express ourselves, buying shit, end of quote. Unexpectedly, though, Bing's speech is lauded by the jury members, who offer him his own channel to vent in this manner twice per week. The last minutes of the episode show us two things. One, we see Bing performing on his channel, endlessly copying the original authentic anger against a fake world he is condemned to live in, holding the glass shard as a signature item, as a brand item. Two, then we see Bing in his new living environment, drinking orange juice in his enormous apartment while watching an endless green forest stretch until the horizon, with birds flying by. Bing's head movements while watching um, the, the lush green vegetation make clear that this is not another two-dimensional virtual projection. It is the real world outside of the realm of fake fodder. Particularly in the hotshot sequences, Black Mirror calls attention to capitalism's endless ways of recuperating protests against itself. One need only think of the fate of Che Guevara, condemned to be memorialized on countless mass-made t-shirts produced by the very system he spent his life trying to overturn, to understand the pointedness of this critique as it takes form with Bing. As a dystopia, Merritt's clearly references Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, which also portrayed a world where sex and drugs function to maintain the status quo, but to thwart any intellectual protest. Moreover, the fact that all people from the same class wear the same color of clothes, yellow for the cleaner slaves, gray for the cyclists, refers to Moore's um, seminal utopia, the text itself utopia, where commoners wear sober clothing, uh, Moore's narrator tell us, but slaves wear gold. Right within this frame, Abby's mentioning that her sister is in Airedale begins to make sense, as the capital of Moore's ideal country, the utopia, is called Air Castle. But rather than expand on this critique of capitalism, I want to draw, call attention again to the remarkable final seconds of the episode, where we can see that nature, that nature in the form of wilderness and forests flourishes outside. The point the episode concludes with is this. When people confine themselves to their own self-made world, like ants never exiting their anthill, we will see a flourishing of the wilderness not seen since the Stone Age. I use the word wilderness here 
because this concept of nature without a human presence has been the subject of substantial critique. Originally, it was a banner on which American environmental activists gathered, as it provided a complex assembly of romantic sublime meanings of, quote, original man, the gender-specific being intentional. The Wilderness Movement, featuring such figures as John Muir and Ralph Waldo Emerson, was not without its success in causing parts of the U.S. to be protected from exploitation. Yet, Cronin argues, um, William Cronin, the, criti the um, thinker that I mentioned earlier, he argues that at the same time, this concept of wilderness has caused us to forget to value all other life around us that is not in the wild. Uh, and I'm going to quote from his work. So, quote, This, then, is a central paradox. Wilderness embodies a dualistic vision in which the human is entirely outside the natural. If we allow ourselves to believe that nature, to be true, must also be wild, then our very presence in nature represents its fall. The place where we are is the place where nature is not. If this is so, if, by definition, wilderness leaves no place for human beings, save perhaps as contemplative sojourners enjoying their leisurely reverie in God's natural cathedral, then also by definition it can offer no solution to the environmental and other problems that confront us. To the extent that we celebrate wilderness as the measure with which we judge civilization, we reproduce the dualism that sets humanity and nature at opposite poles. We thereby, thereby leave ourselves little hope of discovering what an ethical, sustainable, honorable human place in nature might actually look like." End of quote. Cronin's point here is that calling for people to leave wilderness alone and to, to, to isolate wilderness in, 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 in natural parks or wherever ignores the fact that we are always already involved in interacting with our natural environment. And this, um, you know, this is a direct critique of the deep ecology movement, which very much is in the tradition of this discourse of um, man being this, and man being and really gender specific, um, as a soul sojourner in the wild around us, and this is how we should live, and this is how it should stay. Even worse, forgetting um, that we are always already involved in our natural environment, entails that we devalue nature at home, say the apple tree in our backyard, in favor of the wild sierras out there to which we travel by plane or SUV, further adding to the paradox that conserving nature apparently only takes place in natural parks and nowhere else. 15 million merits literalizes Cronin's wilderness paradox. By completely extracting humankind from its natural environment, the wilderness is indeed saved. Um, you see a, a forest that few um, dystopias would, would actually project. It also literalizes the metaphor recycling. In this world, no energy is lost because all calories humans gain are put back into the by cycle. If we remember that Moore's Utopia originally was an island, we have to think the world of Bing and Abbey as an island built out of concrete, isolated from every wild life form, an environmental utopia. And of course you could argue, uh, and you'd be correct, that you know, there are non-human life forms present in this uh, utopia or dystopia. I mean, there's, there's bacteria and being an Abbey's gut, there's, there's, there's these life forms that co cohabit with um, mankind. But that's, those are not the wild life forms um, that, that, that um, both deep ecology and Cronin are talking about. However, so this utopia, which is also a dystopia, hardly seems desirable. Few of us would consider a life like the characters in the show worth living. The episode then calls for a deconstruction of the difference between human and wilderness, for a nuanced investigation of humanity's role in the ecosystem that is our Earth. In this manner, both the Sierras and the grass on our doorstep can be embraced, protected, and respected. Thank you.